If it's in with the new, then it must mean we're out with the old. The 2016 Pixels are getting their last software update soon. So have they actually been good phones? And what's their legacy? This is the Android Police Podcast. It's Wednesday, November 6th. Welcome. I'm Ryan Whitwam alongside Cody Toombs. Uh, before we talk about the Pixels yet again, uh, let's talk about some other news, uh, like Xiaomi. Xiaomi just uh, released a new phone. Uh, it has a 108 megapixel camera sensor. It has a bunch of other cameras too, but everybody's really interested in a 108 megapixel sensor. It doesn't actually produce photos that are 108 megapixels, obviously, crazy, you know, pixel binning nonsense, uh, but that's the number that they're bandying about. Um, and it's otherwise, I mean, it seems like a capable phone otherwise. Uh, this is, it's the, uh, the Mi CC9 Pro because Xiaomi's names always make so much sense. Uh, so it has a Snapdragon 730G. Uh, it has up to eight gigs of RAM, uh, 128 gigs of storage, um, 1080p OLED, 5,260 milliamp hour battery. That's a giant battery uh, for a phone of that size. Uh, it, has a, it has a headphone jack and it's only 550 euros. But you know, this is a Xiaomi phone, so we're not getting it in the US, obviously. Um, so yeah, so the the the, camera that's 108 megapixels i think it's it's the the wide angle right yeah it's your regular main shooter that's uh, semi-wide is how i started thinking of it okay yeah yeah so um and it's so it's 108 megapixels like at the hardware level uh but it does two by two binning so you get a 27 megapixel sort of final uh image and um i think i think i saw yesterday that um the DxO mark had given this some obscenely high rating, um, which I question very much. Well, so when it comes to DxO mark, one of the things to take into account is they basically give more points for more cameras and for more software modes and various things like that. Basically, the more ways you can take pictures, the more points you kind of get just because. So to be fair, this thing with a total of six cameras counting the selfie camera. Uh, yeah, it's going to get a lot of free points just because. But it, from what I heard, I didn't actually get to read the article yet. But from what I heard, it it actually does take some really good pictures. So it may yeah. it may not necessarily be like the top shooter, but it's probably going to do pretty well. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it takes totally passable photos. Um, I think that it's unlikely that it is as good as the Mate 30 Pro, which is what it is tied with on DxO Mark, the uh, 121, the number that makes you know that has like no connection to reality. But <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, the, like DxO Mark has the OnePlus Seven Pro above the Pixel Four, which I think is uh, pretty good evidence that DxO Mark is just making things up at this point. Um, I'm I'm sure like it's I'm sure that their ratings are very internally consistent because they've like given numbers to like all these metrics, but I don't think that those numbers add up to actually telling you what phone is, is better than others. Um, but of course, Xiaomi is is going to be like promoting this like top DxO mark score. Um, of course. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I feel like I feel like Xiaomi's uh, cameras are, are they're usually about like they throw as much hardware at it as possible. They don't have the, the software processing capabilities that uh, like a Huawei or Google phone have. Um, but, you know, but they can do well enough if, you know, they have enough megapixels to work with, I guess. Well, yeah, for sure. I I mean, when it comes to their main shooter, they're throwing everything with a 108 megapixel sensor. They're showing they're throwing everything at the main shooter. But, you know, to its credit, the telephoto, uh, the eight megapixel uh, up to 50 times digital <laughs> telephoto lens. That's uh, you know, that's going to give you a lot of telephoto range. Um, yeah, the yeah, the zoom the zoom setup is kind of weird on this phone. So it's got it's got a twelve megapixel sensor that's two x optical, and then a five megapixel that's ten x hybrid. I don't know exactly what they mean by that because hybrid zoom can mean a lot of things on phones these days. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. My suspicion is they're probably doing something roughly similar to what Google's doing with the Pixel Four, but not I, I doubt it would be anywhere near the same quality yeah um but yeah so i mean 550 euros for this phone uh that's about 500 dollars 
Uh, oh no, wait, I guess the I guess the cheaper version, the cheapest. I guess there are three tiers. The cheapest one with six gigs of RAM starts at about four hundred, which is a really good price. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Xiaomi has, has had years to come to to the U.S. market, and they still haven't done it. And I don't think that with the uh, with the situation in um, with the current administration and Chinese companies, I don't think that they're too anxious to do that. It, it would be a very bad time to make that move when when they could wait, let's say, 18 months and probably yeah. and, and instead of better chance, at least, yeah. at least once trade negotiations have, uh, you know, settled. Yeah, I mean, I would I would like to see Xiaomi be able to launch phones in the US. We could use more competition and they make very good hardware and they are less reliant on just copying Apple in really obscene ways. Uh, a couple of years ago, they wouldn't have been able to be in the US, period, because everything they did was like such a carbon copy. They would have gotten smacked with, with trade dress lawsuits left and right. And to some extent, I almost wonder if maybe that also contributes to why they're being a little laggy about it, because if they were to be a straight copycat and then produce one thing that isn't, they're still going to fall under a lot of scrutiny. Whereas if they produce a few things that ha uh, if they create a gap between their straight copying and uh some of their more original stuff, they'll be they'll be able to fly under the radar a little more easily. Yeah, I mean, if anything, now they're they're copying Huawei. This looks a lot like a Huawei phone. Like, it looks <laughs> yeah, it really a does. lot like a Huawei phone. Uh, okay, but um, I think we've I think we've beaten that to death. Let's uh, let's let's move on. We'll get back to talking about the Pixel now. Why not? So, uh, in case those of you who haven't heard, uh, there there is. A neat little feature on the Pixel 4, a 90 hertz display. Uh, it was one of the main advertising features during the announcement, and it's been one of the big talking points for new phones in the last, say, year, I believe. And 90 hertz phones have, uh, they definitely have their fans. Well, so in the launch of the Pixel 4, it turned out that only when the screen is at 75% brightness or above, does the 90 hertz display actually kick in? Otherwise, it sticks to 60 hertz. Well, in a recent update from Google, that brought it down to, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it 45% think brightness? It, so I think it's like 42 is the number, uh, but only on the mm. small pixel. So on the Pixel 4 XL, it's 90 hertz all the time when you have that option turned on. Uh, but the smaller phone, because the battery life is just, you know, obviously weaker, uh, they didn't want to have uh, 90 hertz on all the time, I guess. Um, so, yeah. So if when, once you update to the monthly patches that just came out, the first updates for the Pixel 4, um, the XL will just be 90 hertz all the time if you have uh, whatever they have. I think they call it smooth display. But if you have that turned on, it's just 90 hertz. So it's more like the OnePlus phones. Even though OnePlus phones say that they will lower to 60 hertz, Sometimes I don't, I don't think that I've really seen that happen so much. Um, but uh, it it'll be on all the time on the on the XL, uh, the small Pixel. Yeah, when it's uh, above forty two percent brightness, it will be in ninety hertz mode. Below that, it will not uh, apparently because um, if you see like the sixty ninety hertz switch at lower brightness levels, it like flickers the screen. It's like really obvious when that happens. So uh, I guess that's why Google still has uh, a limit on that phone. Um, but you, you still can just go into the developer settings and force 90 hertz on all the time. That's actually what I've done on the 4 and the 4XL since I've had them, well, since I finished the review. Um, and I haven't noticed a, you know, a significant difference in, in battery life, at least on the larger phone. The smaller phone, maybe it might be a little bit more noticeable. But um, I guess I can understand why Google is treating the phones differently. I just I just wish they would put they just, just put the, the the force 90 hertz toggle on in like in the display settings instead of hiding it in the developer settings. I think that would just that would calm a lot of people down. Yeah, it really does make a lot more sense to to keep this a little bit more open. And also just because this was something that got advertised so heavily, it seems weird not to yeah. not to sort of make it a little bit uh, yeah. easier was, and up front. It was very weird to have the, the brightness limit on for both phones, like when they first launched it. I think it was, it was, it was, a, it was high, wasn't it? Like the cutoff was like 70% or something? 75. Yeah. 75? Yeah, that's just silly. Um, 
But I mean, but 90 hertz on a phone looks, it looks great. I want more phones to do this. I think this should be like the default uh, for high-end phones now. I really want Samsung to start doing this because their, their displays already look so fantastic. Um, it's a bummer that all the current ones are still 60 hertz. Well, and Samsung displays are already being used to do this on other phones. So it's funny yeah, Samsung right, yeah. itself isn't doing it. They, they, yeah, they, they totally could do it. Um, I mean, Samsung, you know, it, a lot of a lot of what uh, a modern OLED can do is based on like the way the firmware interacts with the phone. Like Samsung's panels, uh, they they have like that outdoor mode that boosts the brightness and like tweaks the contrast and such to make them more readable outside. Um, there's nothing like com like the, the the screen itself isn't like a completely different uh, architecture or something. It's you know, it's just the way Samsung you know controls their screens. Right. And uh, really quick, just for those that uh, may not have already heard, but automatically there are currently four apps that are just automatically locked to 60 hertz. It, there's just no way to to change that, apparently. Uh, that would be Google Maps, Pokemon Go, Waze and WeChat, which is kind of an odd list. I kind of I get it for Maps and Waze, but it, it's funny to me that the other two are on there. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the point of that is. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so screens moving fast, it's a thing. Yeah. Uh, let's switch subjects again. Yeah. I'll just hand that one off to you. Uh, so before we we head in into the break, uh, we covered uh, we covered AT and T's new unlimited plans last week. As always, uh, they aren't really unlimited. Uh, so we thought uh, we'd circle back and tell you uh, that the network just settled with the FTC. They're going to pay a lot of money, kind of. They're going to pay $60 million in fines for throttling unlimited data. Um, here's the thing, though. I am pretty sure that AT&T made a lot more than $60 million throttling this data over the years. Um, so they're probably just going to keep doing silly things like this. Agreed. They're, you know... It's it's typical sort of carrier BS doing carrier things. Yeah, where yeah. th they should they should be punished a little bit more for this. There need to be I don't want to say regulations, but there need to be punishments that actually force I mean, them into taking I, I would I would be fine with regulations that said unlimited actually means unlimited. Damn it. Uh, well, strictly speaking, we already have false advertising laws. So I think it would be fair to say that one's already there. Someone just needs to enforce they should, it. Well, but they they put they 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 put dis disclaimers in in small fonts under all of their ads to protect themselves. But I mean, I think yeah. I think calling these the, like the plans they're offering now unlimited is is ridiculous because, like AT and T's new plans, they have three different tiers of unlimited. How do you how do you do that? Like that, the, it makes it makes zero sense. Um, but yeah, but so the but the the plans that got them fined are not the new fake unlimited plans. They are the plans that uh, they offered years back uh, through, I guess, twenty eleven. That were let's be clear, unlimited. not yet. The the, not the yet. new plans have not gotten them fined yet. Right, right, right. Um, so, so yeah, so but uh, back twenty eleven and earlier, you could buy an unlimited plan from AT and T that you know was supposed to actually be unlimited. But that was back when you couldn't really use a lot of data, like you know, 2009, 2010. Like, there were not a lot of phones really that even had 3G data. Like, Android was in its infancy. The iPhone was like in its second, third generation. Uh, 3G data just wasn't very fast. But then things got faster, and people could use a lot more data. And AT&T is like, oh, we can't be letting you do this. <laughs> yeah, there's it, all the bad habits, all the bad moves. It's it, it all obviously it has to come to a head at some point <laughs> yeah well i mean yeah but i mean the 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 fine is, is so anemic i'm sure at&t this i mean they made i don't i i could probably look it up but i'm sure in excess of like a billion dollars last year they they don't care about 60 million when it probably saved them a lot more money over the years that they were doing this well, it, not to draw too many comparisons, but it's no different than what we've heard of in pharmacy industry, uh, various other oh car industry. Lots of companies do the do bad things and then get a slap on the wrist for it. Yeah. So okay. So AT and T, like the overarching giant conglomerate, made uh, almost twenty billion in twenty eighteen. <laughs> so clearly. Uh, that's a whole whole lot. 
more than the fine. I bet, I, I wonder how much at ts like mobile stuff made. Yeah, I can't find that. I'm not gonna bother looking up right now, but um, yeah, so that's, uh, I'm sure that's just gonna keep happening. Um, but uh, money is money is important sometimes though, like when you're doing a podcast because uh, the money that you that you guys contribute helps us keep doing this. Uh, the Android Police Podcast is live on Twitch four times a week now. That's a lot of us talking to you about technology, and we can't keep doing that if people don't help support it. Uh, the best way that you can do that is to subscribe to Android Police on Twitch. Uh, if you're watching us on Twitch now, that's awesome. You're already almost there. You can just click click the buttons to subscribe. You can pay money for a subscription, but if you are an Amazon Prime member, uh, you have one free subscription every month and you can give that to us. It costs you no extra money and we get money from Amazon, which is great for everybody. It's a win-win. Uh, you do have to re-up that subscription every month, so please do remember to do that. Uh, we have all the instructions uh, for that at twitch.tv slash Android Police. And uh, you can also go to, go to Android Police and there's a donate button where you can give us uh, other monies just because you like us so much, which I'm sure you do, right? Okay. So let's get back to the show. All right. So Google is just about to sunset the original Pixel and Pixel XL. Uh, they've, they've received a whole extra uh, year of support beyond what was originally promised they were they were originally guaranteed two years and they've managed to make three and google has now also confirmed that it there's going to be a single security update coming in december so uh for some reason they've decided to skip october and november security updates for those phones but they'll be doing one combined uh sort of wrap-up update for those for the original Pixel and Pixel XL. Yeah. I mean, hopefully that last update will include some bug fixes because I mean, they just they just updated these phones to Android 10, and it's probably not a good idea to move your three year old phone to a, a new OS and then immediately stop updating it. Like there are going to be things wrong. Yeah, I well, I've been harping on this in general that <laughs> the software updates that they have to do are at t at this point when we're talking security updates, it's generally a lot of changes that go to the AOSP code and mostly pretty trivial stuff. It's the security updates typically aren't that large. So for the most part, it seems weird to not sort of take the win and just keep pushing security updates for the next year. It it would cost them very little in terms of time testing and work, but they would have a better reputation just for doing it. I, so, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they released an occasional security update for these phones. I feel like Google probably doesn't want to get in the habit of doing it every month indefinitely because then when they just sort of stop at whatever period they, they decide to stop at, then people will like be extra upset because if they thought they were getting updates forever for some reason, like they said three years and they're like, they're like, okay, regular updates are over, but we're going to do one more. It's like they're giving you something like out of the goodness of their heart instead of just like continuing on business as usual and then taking it away later. Yeah, <clears throat> overall, this is one of those things where it, the the phone has done so well. It has plenty of fans. It just seems strange to not not keep the goodwill going on that. Uh, and I agree. Even moving to uh, an every three months schedule would be perfectly fine for most security updates. I think I think most people would accept that. But yeah, it seems strange to be doing this on on the other side. At the very least. There's going to be so many uh, third-party firmware or third-party ROMs that are going to be supporting this phone for what will seem like forever. So yeah, I mean, it was it was it was a pretty popular phone among nerds when it came out, um, and unless you bought the Verizon version, it has an unlockable bootloader. So and I think even the Verizon version, there was a workaround when it first came out to unlock the bootloader. So I mean, a lot of people probably have phones that are unlocked and ready to install ROMs on. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was maybe some other way to fix it even now, but yeah, but I mean, but I mean, the original Pixels, I think they were in it. They, they might, they might be like my favorite overall out of the series because I don't, I don't feel like there were really any major objections to it. Um, it it's like people were like annoyed, like oh, it's like 
it just looks like an HTC phone. But like, that's not really a bad thing. Like HTC manufactured those phones. Um, I think the hardware was solid. Uh, the screens were very good for the time. You know, they were, um, they were good quality Samsung displays. Uh, they were 16.9, right when we were kind of moving towards taller screens that give you a little bit more screen real estate. So the bezels are kind of big. Um, there's no wireless charging, but it does, I mean, they still have really good cameras. They have very similar cameras to what you can get in like the Pixel 3 or the Pixel 3a. It's just the single sensor, but it has, you know, most of Google's uh, processing stuff still. Um, battery life on the small one was always, you know, not as kind of mediocre. If you're still using that phone now, I feel like you probably would have replaced the battery. But um, the XL, I think, was was fine. Um, I liked that they were they were metal phones. They were like the last flagship phones that were predominantly metal, the Pixels. Um, but that, you know, meant no wireless charging, which, which for some people probably doesn't matter. But um, no, they were just like, they were good, solid phones. And um, I feel like every generation since then, uh, even though I have I have always liked the Pixel phones, uh, there's always one or two things that people like complain about at length. Uh, and, you know, and a lot of the complaints are entirely justified, especially when Google is like charging more money for them. Um, but I mean, the, the original Pixels, I think, were just sort of generally pretty well uh, regarded by everybody. Yeah, it's... I, I mean, I have all four generations of Pixel right next to me at in different sites. Well, they've all been XLs except for the Pixel 3. Uh, and it is, I would say, by far the one that I've I've basically liked the most when I first got it. Not to say it doesn't have some problems as a result of aging. Uh, the, the camera, to me, is noticeably not as good as the following generations. The, uh, the battery life has degraded naturally over time though it actually still holds up pretty well and i agree the screen was the screen was really good and definitely in its time and i would say compared to a couple of the lg screens that made their way into future models uh the screen is better so yeah it i think it was by far the best pixel that has come out so far in, in its time yeah yeah i mean i wouldn't want to use the original pixel now instead of the pixel 4 i think that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't be a very good time for me. But um, yeah, I mean, when the, when the original Pixel came out in 2016, I feel like it was very clearly the phone that I wanted to use day to day. Um, and I, I still feel like the Pixel 4 is what I want to use most days, but uh, it's a much closer competition. Uh, yeah, certainly. I Right now I'm enjoying the Pixel 3, but uh, yeah, it's 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 tough. Uh, I, I can look back on the pixel and I still think I could go back and use this pretty comfortably where I don't know that I would say that about it. Almost any other phone from that time period. Yeah. So rest, rest in peace, original pixel. You will be missed, but I'm sure that, uh, we'll keep talking about it in like, um, lineage OS <laughs> update posts. Well, come December, it'll probably return as a topic. Yeah. Yeah. And well, uh, I mean, speaking of things coming up from the grave, right, yeah. so before the Pixel, there were Nexus phones. Google made those for years. They were like the vehicle for the new version of Android, and that's basically it. They they weren't great phones. They were just great software. Um, so Google right now is trying to get everybody to to buy a Pixel Four to upgrade, and they're offering some kind of not great trade in values on their phones. We've talked about that. Uh, but Google really outdid themselves on this one. So there's there's uh, there's a Google Store ad out there telling telling everybody you can get a Pixel Four for as low as seven hundred and seventy three dollars. That's a whopping uh, twenty six bucks off with a trade in of a Nexus Six P. But then you you look a little a little closer and uh, Google actually doesn't accept that phone for trade in at all. Period. And even if they did, twenty six dollars is silly. You can you can sell a Nexus a Nexus six B on Swappa for like seventy five or eighty bucks, uh, if that's what you wanted to do. If you had a Nexus six B that you just really wanted to get rid of, um, so yeah, Google's trade in values are bad and apparently not even accurate. So you should just if you have an old Google phone and you want a new Google phone, just sell the old one and use the money to buy the new phone. Yeah, and it's it's the same routine that most of the trade ins from companies go with they they're basically just using a third party company to accept trade-ins and whatever deal that company gives as a as an equated value uh it 
the primary seller can choose like here's how much we're willing to lose on this deal but uh yeah this is it, it's pointless it, trade-ins from almost any company are terrible so i kind of you know i don't expect much in that sense but it, the mere fact that they're showing an ad for something that simply truly can't even be used is hilarious yeah that is yep that is silly okay so um let's move on to questions we actually have one this week so um <clears throat> xd 1936 in the chat room it's a very descriptive name uh, he said, I'm pretty heavily invested in the Google ecosystem. We're having our first kid in January, and I'd like to give our parents, these soon-to-be grandparents, some Google smart displays slash home hubs for Christmas. How would you recommend we set them up? Should I tie them to my account and configure them as mine? Should I share an album with their accounts after they open it and set it up as, and set it up as them? Uh, they already have Google accounts, and I'm cautious of leaving those settings in their hands. <laughs> I mean, that's an entirely... Uh, it's an entirely reasonable concern. Um, so if they already have Google accounts, I feel like as long as you do the original, the, the initial setup for them with their accounts, uh, there's not too much chance that they will screw up the settings. Um, you can create an album and share it with them in Google photos. Um, and then go in, you know, in, in the home app, you can like go and like on their account, set that as, as the ambient display for, for their smart displays. Um, and then the nice thing about that is that you can keep adding things to that shared album and it'll keep updating the photos that show up on their display. Um, and then just tell them not to mess with the Google Home settings. Just stay stay out of there. Um, as I don't think that there's any way they can really mess it up just from using the display. Um, and the nice thing then is if it's attached to their accounts, the displays will work as intended. It'll show them their data instead of yours. Uh, so that is what I would do. Yeah, pretty much agreed. I, I would go, I would even go specifically to saying don't use your own account to do setup because uh, it there they will get possibly weird answers to questions. They'll get things like your your itineraries and yeah. uh, anything like yeah, that. Yeah, you, because you I mean, the, that. yeah, the displays like they pull things from your email uh, to like create uh, reminders on the device, which is actually super cool if it's your data. <laughs> Like, like when I have a flight coming up, uh, I just like, I like walk into the kitchen and it's like, oh, hey, your flight's on time. Did you know that? So it's like, that's handy. But if it's not your flight, then you're like, why? This isn't useful to me. And all things considered, we're describing how things are right now. Give it another six months to a year and who knows what new feature Google might create yeah, yeah, or I mean, add you don't, that's you don't want, totally throw it off. You don't want it to be totally reliant on your account. Uh, since they already have Google accounts, it's easier to just use theirs you know, and just share them, share the album and make sure they don't change their ambient display settings. And even if they do, it's not, you know, too hard to change it back. Like if they call you, they're like, the pictures are gone. You, you can walk them through how to use the home app to like change it back to the, the album. So yeah, that is our recommendation. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and unless there's any more on that, I think we can pretty much wrap it up. Uh, so, We've gotten some great responses from the Android. Uh, I can't read today. We've gotten some great responses from our Android Police podcast survey, but we really, we'd really like to hear more from you. Uh, we'd like to know what you like about the new format, what we can change, how how we're doing with everything, and uh, if you'd like to leave your thoughts, head to Bitly. That's bit.ly/slash survey and po. That's S U R V E V E Y A N D P O and leave your thoughts there. It only takes a few minutes to submit your answers and it's completely anonymous. So uh, basically head there, just let us know what you're thinking. And if you'd like, you can also uh, send email to podcast at androidpolice.com and uh, just let us know anything that doesn't really fit within the survey. Yeah. So, uh, and that and that is, uh, I guess, the end of the show this time. Uh, on Twitter, uh, I am Ryan Whitwam. Cody is uh, at Cody underscore Tombs. Our producer, Jules Wang, is Jules. No, I'm sorry, is Point Jules. And our theme music is By Home. Uh, I hope that you have a great rest of your week, and we will see you again on Friday. So uh, come back for that one. I'm sure that one will be just as good as this one. <laughs> <laughs>